Welcome to the Pitch Podcast, where entrepreneurs and cutting edge companies come to tell us about the products they're making, the ideas they're spending time on, and the problems they're solving. Here's your host, Warren Spiewak. Welcome to the Oil & Gas Pitch Podcast. Today is really a interesting episode because I knew about Shante Eden for some time. I met her here at uh, Greentown Labs, which this is where we're at. Thank you, Greentown Labs, for sharing the facility. And, um, you know, here on Pitch, we've had technology companies, all kinds of service companies to the oil and gas industry. But Shantae's business focuses on people. And the more I talk to CFOs out in the world, and, and really um, you hear this time and time again, business and the talent that you have on your teams is important. And learning how to optimize that is what we're going to be talking about today. Shantae, thank you for making it here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks, Greentown Labs yeah. as well. I mean, it's a great facility that's really, I think, full of collaboration and energy. So it's good to be here. Yeah. So let's kind of start there. You know, you've been a company. I met you here. You were working very much in the DEI space. So yep. why don't we, for the listener, explain what that is and kind of put it some context to it. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, which the acronym is DEI, is really, I think, a hot topic for today. I mean, not just because of the outcomes that it affects. I mean, if you think about some of the stats related to it, there, you know, companies with inclusive cultures are about eight times more likely to meet their business outcomes, mm. you know, twice as more likely to meet their financial performance. Um, and then the stats just go on and on. And so if you think about the energy sector, especially going through energy transition and how do we really optimize our talent and our people, um, so that we can reach those goals um, is what why D&I is, is uh, in high demand. You know, it's interesting because just us sitting here, it takes me back to my first conversation with you, which was about equity. And you really kind of explained it in a way where many times people think of diversity and inclusion, they kind of have a, a, a guess of what it is, but it's really not that surface level that we all think of it. It's really about biases across the board and it really gets into performance, which is the part that uh, for me, I think is really impactful for the companies that are listening and for yep. the people that, obviously you've worked with some big names, I won't drop names, mm -hmm. but, um, but these companies really uh, know that this creates results and it's important. That's right, so I like to think about, you know, think about diversity as just all of the great things that make us unique with our identity, our culture, our background, experiences. Um, and inclusion is just the feeling of uh, being valued and respected, right, mm -hmm. for those differences. And equity is really, you know, we want a, a fair and just environment. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about just standard processes? Are we giving everybody an equal chance, an equitable chance to succeed? Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's about. And so when I go into organizations, it's really helping define that for them, you know, what's their current culture and how to, again, we continue to optimize and create, create sustainable change. Oh, I love that because culture, I mean, that really is like when you have synergy and people are thriving in their workplace, um, you can tell. I mean, we've all been to places where you could you can just feel that the culture is bad. If I could tell a personal story, I mean, the first time I thought about getting into the DEI work was because of my own personal experience where I, you know, had worked on this executive presentation, came into a conference room, and the leader there at the time told me, sit in the back of the room. Mm, and so wow. in that moment, you know, I honestly didn't know how I was gonna respond, but I disengaged for several weeks. And so if you think about if, if individuals are not feeling like they are valued and their contributions are respected, then they're not going to perform at a high level. And that impacts the bottom line. That is incredible. Cause so, I'm, you know, here it is, I know you. I mean, I've seen you in meetings where you're bringing solutions to the table, not just in the DI world, but from an operations standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a robust background. But to think that Shante Eden walks into a room and somebody tells her to sit in the back of I, the room. I didn't, by the way. But I yeah. bet you did. Good. <laughs> I love that. I, uh, but, but, but I would totally see how immediately the feeling that that must have felt like, I exactly. can't imagine. Exactly. So 
capture that feeling and that's what that's the opposite of inclusion mm -hmm. right we want people to walk into those rooms perform at a high level contribute at a high level and have a voice and have right? a voice right and solve the world's most complex problems that's right <laughs> and that and this is something i think for all of us anybody you know when you have a team that feedback that the team has is invaluable especially yep. when you're working in an economy like today where um these, the way the workforce is, the geography of the workforce, uh, there's so many different points of view that can actually help you capture more. Absolutely. So te teams are about 20 times more um, collaborative and, um, and more innovative as well. So if you think about that collaboration, innovation that happens that help you develop the products and services that are, um, that's really uh, meeting a need for your mm -hmm. market. I would like to say, you know, what we really do is help bridge the gap between strategy and execution. So a lot of times organizations have the strategy, they either, either have, you know, they're at capacity with their current leadership team. So they want augmented or interim leadership to come and help them execute on those um, strategy. And when I think about change, I think about systems and processes to help really drive the sustainable change that's needed within the organization and reshape uh, the culture. So that's at the heart of what we do. And then our mission is to enrich cultures, right? One interaction at a time. So very similar to what you and I are doing, I typically sit down with leaders to understand what's their challenges today and how I can help support with those solutions and provide a fit for purpose um, package for them where again, they're, they're getting someone with experience mm -hmm. to come and help lead the very uh, difficult and sometimes complex um, solutions. You know, um, one of the meetings that I was in about diversity was very interesting because, um, you know, here it is, we're in California. It's a big group of almost all men. There was two women in these kind of consultations or in the, a meeting like what I was at, it was like, no, like you actually take all that away. Everything becomes a little more of a safe place to communicate. Is that, would you say that that's part of it? I do. And I think, you know, really understanding the space is starting off with curiosity, right? So what, you know, what is the other person feel comfortable with you mm -hmm. addressing them as, right? And when we think about diversity, I feel like in uh, equity and inclusion, honestly, I feel like we have got to have these very open, mm -hmm. transparent conversations to move past talking talking about it yeah. to actually do something about I it. I love that because one of the things I love about you is that you're you're not overly sensitive. You're actually the opposite. You want to you actually like to embrace the collision of people sharing what they believe because yes. even for no matter where you are on the ethnic spectrum or gender spectrum there's biases. I mean, a lot yeah. of people in this meeting, I remember just having, it was a predominantly white group of people too. And they're going like, we're not allowed to say we have a bias, but your point of view is that there everybody is bias. Has, everybody has a bias, right? And we just need to acknowledge them, right? And, and be very intentional about how we mitigate those mm -hmm. biases. I mean, I have a bias for women, right? <laughs> yeah. I have to be very conscious not to hire just uh, women, sure. right? And so everybody has that. It there's, makes there's sense. There's no getting, getting away from it. Yeah, you see, I mean, you hear about it all the time and it is, again, it's just kind of something that people preclude and they, they guess it, but, um, but it's not till you really dive into this stuff, you realize how really performance yeah. uh, effective it is it is and um on the on the topic of biases it's, it's really it's not a bad word mm -hmm. right it's not a bad word it's about um something as simple as you know i lean towards my alma mater mm -hmm. people that's you know come from my alma mater to hire it is just, all the texas a&m people are that, listening going like oh yeah oh yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right, right. I guess so so, yeah. so everybody has it in some shape or form and it's just being able to acknowledge it and move past it to bring in the most diverse perspectives as possible to drive the business outcomes and mm -hmm. like i say it's you know not only does it in pre-performance, but it also is just the right thing to do. So I'm reading here the fractional DEI leadership. Like, can we go into that a little bit? What fractional DEI leadership is essentially interim leadership that comes in, helps, you know, develop the strategy related mm. to DEI, do annual, you know, road mapping, right, initiative, um, outline the initiatives that need to take place in order to really drive the change and the actions. Mm -hmm. And so imagine having a leader come in and with that level of intent and focus to help you really move your organization mm -hmm. forward, mm -hmm. right? 
somebody who is objective, um, that knows how to work across functions mm -hmm. and um, meet people where they are in this, right? And it's not, it's not an out-of-the-box solution. It's really a fit for purpose. Mm. And that's the only way that it's going to work. I love that. Some of the other um, things that I do for organizations, if you think about the fractional technology and operations, it is, you know, maybe they have, you know, several projects that are going on and they want to set up a new project office to be mm -hmm. more, to create more standardization and optimize their people and their resources. Um, it could be merger integration where you need somebody to come in mm. and actually um, lead those effort again more ob objectively um, or just a large scale initiative that the team just doesn't have um, time to do. And so you need somebody with that experience. I love that. And the other thing is, is I, I know we've talked about this before, but sometimes companies want to do the right thing, but they can't afford to really invest the kind of money to to have their own department. Of absolutely. DI. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, that's why I decided to go with the fractional model, because most times and when I talk to companies, they want to do something. Mm -hmm. They either don't know where to start or they don't have the resources or infrastructure in-house to get it going. And so and that's the that's the bridge that I create. I also work with clients that are global because everybody's in a different place with their journey. Yeah. Right. And so again, it's going in assessing where they are and where they have those gaps and where I can help fill the need. So, okay, and then we'll, we'll, I'll let you keep getting on to your presentation, but I, I, I already can see how this is a fit for a lot of companies, mm -hmm. right? I mean, especially with the focus of talent and people. Um, but all right, go, let's keep rolling. Well, I mean, a part of that, once we know what the strategy is, um, then we need to make sure that it gets fully you know, executed and adopted. Mm -hmm. So that's the people side of the change that we're talking about too, right? Is how do we train? How do we communicate? How do we affect systems and processes and really make it a part of the, the culture? Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the fourth pillar I would like to mention is, is coaching. And the reason why coaching is important is because it drives action. Mm. And so imagine you go through training for you know inclusive leadership, it's a great workshop, but then what do you do with that material, mm. right? And so how do we follow up with action-oriented steps that is defined for the individual or the company that they could do to really affect change? And this takes me back to the thing, is like if you're at work and you have, whether it's, I'm not, it, it doesn't have to be a hostile work environment, it's just something yeah. where you just don't know how to approach it. How great is it to have a conversation with someone that knows this in and out, who's been in the industry okay. and really knows how to open up that dialogue? Because it, it seems like I hear this again and again with, with, with pretty much this entire subject, which is communication is such a catalyst for things to work. Absolutely. It's... Um it's, I'm going to say this one more time, yes. systems and processes too, right? So it's not only us defining what the new processes might need to be. If you think about how do we attract talent, mm -hmm. how do we hire talent, how do we develop and promote the talent? Um, oh, uh, that makes, I right? gotta, I'm going to interrupt you because speaking about hiring talent, you know, when a company is getting resumes, they don't know necessarily what the background is of each person. And I would imagine that there are steps people can take in order to have a bigger, wider talent pool. Is is that a, is that kind of a yeah. possibility? Yes, and I'm going to back up even further when you think about where do you go to attract the talent that you're looking for? Are you going to diverse places? Are you going to, you know, maybe it's um, it's a associations that support a specific ethnic group, mm -hmm. or maybe it's HBCUs, which is historically black college and universities. And so where are you going to attract those, mm. that talent? And then once you actually get the resumes in, and there's different tactics to use, blonde resumes, wave mm -hmm. maybe one, mm -hmm. although there could be bias with that. Mm -hmm. But also, um, how do you interview? Are you interviewing with a diverse panel? If oh, you're going to interview yeah. a woman, yes. don't put her in front of all male yeah, sure. panel, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, it, it reminds me of a, a conversation I had with uh, the Mercury Fund, which is a totally different industry, but Heath Butler mentioned to me, he's like, more. If you want to change 
the the appearance and and work with the underrepresented founders you got to change the investors yes. to some degree right because <laughs> yes. it's because of these biases and so Absolutely. um it is interesting and i i, I love that uh, we're diving into this anything else you want to share if they want to really affect change within the organization it has to be intentional mm -hmm. right you it's might making the choice is, is making an intentional choice that i want to do I want to lead in a different way, mm -hmm. right? And I want my workforce to be, you know, fully inclusive. I want to look around the room and see the diversity on the team. And I want people to feel valued and respected. And not that they don't, but how can you continue to enrich that, yeah. right? And make sure that it's sustainable and for growing organizations that it's scalable. Mm, scalable. You know, thinking about this and kind of knowing the results, right? At the end of the day, it's like, what does your team look like and feel like whenever you implement a strategy. When you think about, you know, look at your leadership team, if mm -hmm. your leadership team is all the same, that's a call to action for yes. you. Right. But when you think about it, the more you diversify your team, the more you're diversifying your ideas and the points of view. Yep. And I had a conversation with the Caucasian male about, you know, he his point was, well, I'm not sure I feel comfortable talking about it. Mm -hmm. And my response to him was, if you don't talk about it, who will? Exactly. Because you're in the decision making roles and just imagine the influence yeah. that you have to really affect change. Yes. And so let's leverage that influence for the better. Yeah, it's true. Like if you have a room of 50 people and no one's speaking up and going like, like a perfect example would be someone saying, I'm the person that has all the biases. No one has a bias against me or whatever. The problem is it, it takes one person to speak up and then everyone else will talk. You have That's to have, right. it's like judo. You got to get, you have to kind of work the room and get people to start to feel comfortable. Yep. And that goes into trust, you know, leadership having the trust of their teams and yep. the teams trusting their leadership. That's right. All right. So uh, I love it. Thank you. So tell let's talk about like if somebody's listening, they want to like meet with you or maybe they just want to see if this is something that would be a good fit for their company. What's the best avenue? The best way to get in touch with me is through LinkedIn. I'm, I'm really active there. And if you reach out to me on LinkedIn, I will follow up. And I think then it's just a few minute conversation for to talk about, you know, what may work for your organization. Well, Thank you, Shante, and everyone check out Leaders Edge Consulting, find her on LinkedIn. I will have all the contact information in the show notes. And thank you for tuning in to the Oil and Gas Pitch Podcast. Thanks thank you, Shante. Absolutely.